In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If I were to tell you that names have power, and that if you know the true name of a thing or of a person, you have power over it, you would probably assume that I was talking about the ancient world and the sort of superstitions that if you knew someone's true name, you could draw a heavenly curse or blessing upon them, that knowing the true name of something gave you power over it. But actually, I can make that claim of the modern day. Consider the whole phenomenon of identity theft on the internet, that if somebody gets a hold of enough information about you, enough of the names by which you go by, not just your legal name, but your social security number, your date of birth, all these other identifying questions that people ask you when you, you call your bank, you know, and they ask you what was the name of the best man at your wedding and that sort of thing. If people have enough of that information about you, the names that you go by, then they can steal your very identity and spend money on your behalf and do all kinds of nefarious things. Consider that the, one of the most powerful hacktivist groups on the internet is called Anonymous. Right? Because they know that as long as they keep their identity secret from the authorities that are trying to track them, they have a measure of safety. The hacktivists, anonymous, one of their specialties is uh, retribution on the internet for things they perceive as wrong as done to people in the community. Uh, for example, after uh, Amanda Todd, uh, a, teenager, a Canadian teenager, uh, committed suicide because she was shamed on the internet, anonymous took it upon themselves to try to figure out who it was that had been tormenting her anonymously on the internet. And when they found who they thought it was, then they publicized information about this man so that people could know who he was and uh, retribution could come uh, through the internet. Um, incidentally, by the way, there's, there's a claim that they perhaps were wrong about who they thought did it, but you know, that's the limitations of, of crowdsourced justice, I suppose. In the Bible, of course, we have many instances of things being named, uh, lots of place names, lots of people names, many of which have interesting translations if you, if you go into them. Uh, here's a hint. Anything with El, El is God. So, you know, for example, Bethel, house of God, Beth meaning house, uh, Bethlehem, house of bread, interestingly, and, and Peniel, you know, this place where God was, etc. But naming, I would suggest, is actually really just a short form of storytelling that when we name a person or an object, what we're really doing is trying to tell a story about it. Uh, consider the ways that most of us probably have some story about where our names come from, the names that our parents chose for us. My name, William Tay, was chosen because that was a family name going back many generations. Um, William Tay came over to America in time for the French and Indian Wars and the, the 17th century. Uh, you know, that, that kind of story gets told. And, and when people hear that, they know something about my family, not just that they were in the United States for a long time, but there's something in that about how they know something about their history and they, they care about it and they're very sort of traditional in how they do names. Uh, other people have other kinds of names that come from other stories. Uh, you know, there was um, uh, a person recently who named their child after Pearson Airport. Uh, because Pearson Airport is their favorite place in the world. They, they have pleasant associations with it. And, you know, I don't blame them entirely. I mean, don't you get excited when you go to the airport and you're traveling for a vacation or even work and you're kind of excited to visit a new city, a new place? Uh, I can sort of see that, although I still think it's a bit odd, but that's another story. Naming as storytelling. Think about how nicknames function in community to incorporate individuals. Like, you know you're part of a team when they give you a nickname. Uh, I, a couple of years ago, I watched this documentary uh, reality show about the Canadian Air Force and how they train fighter pilots. And in this class of about two dozen fighter pilots, to, you know, want to be fighter pilots, flying F-18s, there was uh, one woman uh, in the group, in the class. And when she graduated, uh, they gave her a nickname, and they gave her the nickname Guns. And they gave her that name because she turned out to be extremely accurate and deadly with a 20 millimeter cannon on her airplane. <laughs> so they called her Guns. And as she uh, was given that name as part of the ritual, she had to drink a shot of whiskey or something that was poured down a gun barrel, right? And that was how that community marked her membership as one of the guys, as, as one of them in their community. Uh, last summer, I was given a nickname. I, I was temporarily uh, on a sailing team that, that I don't normally race with, and uh, they were kind of trying to figure out who I was, and they found it kind of weird that I was a priest and all that kind of stuff, so they were teasing me a lot about that, and then they decided to give me a nickname. They called me the Squirrel of God. <laughs> 
instead of the Lamb of God, Squirrel of God, because my position on the crew was to be the most junior uh, uh, gopher kind of position, which is called the squirrel, because you're just inside the boat, like down underneath like a little squirrel, you know, and dealing with the sails and stuff. You don't even get to see what's going on on the race course. You're just in this hot, stuffy compartment the whole time. <laughs> and so then they decided, Squirrel of God. And you know, when I see those guys, sometimes they still call me that, that nickname as a mark of their affection and their, their mark of, of knowing that I was part of their community. Naming with our, is a, therefore a sort of short form of storytelling. Consider though how that can actually have some other interesting implications. Besides marking inclusion in a community, it can also affect a kind of healing. If I were to tell you the name Scott Miles, uh, sorry, Miles Scott, you probably wouldn't know who that is. But if I were to tell you Bat Kid in San Francisco, many of you probably heard that story. Just out of curiosity, who's heard the Bat Kid story? Okay, about half of the, half of you, okay. So what happened was, the, uh, there was this, this child, uh, he's five years old, Miles Scott, uh, living in San Francisco, actually outside of San Francisco in a small town of about a thousand people. And uh, Miles has leukemia, and he spent uh, the last uh, couple of years of his childhood in a series of treatments and chemotherapy and other things, you know, in and out of hospitals and other clinics. And so he really didn't have a childhood. And now that he's in remission and he's coming out of his cancer, uh, the Make-A-Wish Foundation approached his family and they said, you know, we'd like to give him some of his childhood back. How can we do that? And so they, told, they, they asked Miles and they talked to his parents. They discovered that, that his big fantasy, his big wish, was that he wanted to be Bat Kid. He wanted to be Batman's sidekick. And so the Make-A-Wish Foundation decided they would try to make this come true. And then it got blogged about on the internet, and then it exploded. People loved this idea. And so thousands and thousands of people participated in a gigantic uh, story that took place in the streets of San Francisco. It included the chief of police, the mayor, uh, the mascot for the local baseball team, all kinds of different people pitched in to make this happen. Uh, somebody even volunteered a Ferrari to be turned into the Batmobile temporarily. Uh, so, and it gives you a sense of the scale of this thing. And thousands of thousands of people showed up for a, a parade on one of the streets in San Francisco to welcome Bat Kid with signs that said, we love you, Bat Kid, and, and similar kinds of things. And they, they gave him the key to the city. And I mean, if you watch the video, I guarantee it'll make you cry, right? Um, that story that we tell about Bat Kid had a healing impact on that young boy's life. He will never forget this. And by the way, probably any gift that anyone ever gives him will never be <laughs> quite up to the standard set by the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Poor kid. But amazingly, this has an impact, not just on that child, but on everyone who hears the story of compassion and how community can be united behind an effort at healing. We, of course, say things about our community. We give this community names. We call it the Church of the Messiah. And often when we say church, we have a, a very particular notion in our minds of what we mean by that, a notion which others might not hold outside of these walls. It's uh, one of the interesting kind of problems is that we have to, as Christians, uh, take ownership of the church community uh, as a name and kind of reclaim it, re-justify it. For example, um, when, when you say church and you, you ask people what that what they, comes to mind, they've done surveys about this, they, they often feel that church is uh, uh, irrelevant, boring, and untrue. <laughs> and I would argue strongly that church is none of those three things. At least, you know, not Church of the Messiah. We certainly ain't boring. We might be many things, but we're not boring, right? Is it relevant? Well, I believe so. Is it true? Of course. Otherwise, I certainly would not have put my life into this. And, and so on, right? And I think many of you would feel the same way. But we have to reclaim that name, church, and change the story that's told about it. This is nothing new for us as Christians. Consider the way that in baptism we give a new identity to the person who is baptized. We welcome them into a much larger story about what God is doing in the world. Interestingly, when it comes to naming in the story of Jesus, we get a very great scene here, this Lamb of God business. Now, by the way, Lamb of God is actually a, it's a very unusual phrase in the New Testament. It, it appears more in the book of Revelation, I think it's like 26 times or something. But in the canonical Gospels, John, Mark, Luke, Matthew, it only appears this one time in this formulation of, of actually the Lamb of God. And what's weird is that he says, uh, John says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
That's strange because lambs were not a sacrifice for atonement of sin. That was bulls. Lambs were, were sacrificed as part of the ritual Passover to mark how God delivered the people of Egypt out of slavery by, by sparing them when the plague came over the land and killed the firstborn. So it's actually a symbol of, of God's mercy and deliverance rather than, than God being, you know, participating in kind of retribution and demanding sacrifice for sin. But historically, we have taken the Lamb of God as, as this image of atonement and sacrifice. And, I tell this because I want to complicate our notions of what we think these names mean. Names like Lamb of God may have a much more complex history and meaning to them than we assume. You see, because names are always limited in their ability to convey anything true about the thing being named. There is a limitation. If I told you, if you didn't know me, that my name was Squirrel of God, the ideas that would come into your head would be very limited. <laughs> Even if I told you that my name was William Tay, that wouldn't mean anything to you unless you knew more about my story and where that name came from. That's true of any nickname, really. Um, that woman that was named Guns, would you know what that meant? If you were told that she was a fighter pilot then, you get that little glimpse of the story, you start to get deeper in her. But do you know anything else about her story, how she became a pilot in the first place? Why would she want to uh, join this elite fighter squadron, and et cetera, et cetera? So the limitation of the name, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then he tells the story again several times, right? John testified again, I saw the Spirit descending on him. A little, a little bit later, he says, you know, the next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. Again, he tells the story. He tells the name. He said, look, here is the Lamb of God. Finally, some of his disciples get it, apparently. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And when Jesus saw them following him, he said, what are you looking for? You know, what name are you looking for? What, what identity? And they immediately refer to him as rabbi. We get yet another name, teacher, wise one. Where are you staying? You know, that's an odd question. And he says, come and see. So his response to these questions of identity is to engage them deeper into community. He doesn't say, I'm staying in, in, in Simon's house. I'm, I'm staying at uh, the house of, uh, you know, Richard. <laughs> no, he says, come and see, come into relationship. Because there's a limitation to the name. If he had just simply told them where he was staying, that might have been the end of the conversation. But instead, he invites them into fellowship to break bread with him. And they remain with him, it says. Now, that word in Greek uh, for remain, uh, mino, uh, appears a lot in the Bible. And it's a very important word because abide in, dwell in, becomes this image that goes way beyond just simply being next to somebody at a party. It means that you actually are, are, are coming into their life in an important way. So we say that we dwell with God. We dwell in God in baptism. It's using that Greek word of, of dwelling in the deepest possible sense. So story does have its limitation, and it seems to be a kind of launch pad, if you will, into the reality of engagement with a thing being named. In other words, we go from knowing the name of an object or a person to actually meeting them then we start to form new stories and new names for that thing. So our challenge as a community is to go beyond just simply calling this a church to the next level of engagement and specificity with the names in which we use. Yes, it's a church. It's also what? A community? It's also what? A ninja squad of God's warriors in the world trying to change the place for truth and justice? Sure, I like ninjas. Uh, what else could it be? Is this uh, a fellowship of people who look out for each other, who care for each other, who are a kind of family? Yes, sure. And on and on go the names pointing toward a reality that we experience only when we come into contact with the thing that we are struggling to articulate. And that's how mystery works. Mystery is that moment when we swirl around that thing and give it name after name after name, attempting to find what is true about that experience. That's the reason why God has a name which is utterly unutterable. You know, the, the traditional name for God, which appears in the Hebrew scriptures, uh, is, is called in Greek the tetragrammaton because it's four letters, tetra, four. Four letters, which by tradition are, are never spoken in the synagogue. Uh, you'll never find a rabbi say that word. Uh, and in fact, in, in the Old Testament, the only time that word was ever spoken was during the high holy festivals, and it was spoken by the high priest. And while he said it, everyone else would make this big din of noise so that no one could hear the name, because if they knew the true name of God, they'd have some kind of power over God. So that name, when it's printed in Hebrew, they don't put the vowels on it. 
It's just the four words. And when they come across it, they replace it with a title. They say, uh, the Lord, right? Adonai in Hebrew. So you'd be reading along, you know, thus says Adonai, right? Rather than thus says the word, which we don't even really know how it was really pronounced, but the word is represented by those four holy letters. Again and again with the mystery of God, we swirl around trying to poke at it with names, trying to give it an identity as a way not only to have power over it, but I would suggest to bring it into relationship with us, to bring it into community. Remember about how nicknames bring things closer, bring people together? It's the same thing with the names that we use for God or for this holy community that we gather in every Sunday. So what I want to challenge us with is what new names can we come up with for this community? What new names can we give to articulate the story of what we're about in this community? I'm just putting that out there. I want you to think about it. And now, as I customarily do, I'm going to open this up for a little bit of feedback if people have things they'd like to share in response.